The Bible, comprising both the Old and New Testaments, is the primary religious text for humanity's largest religion. It is the number one best-selling book of all time, having been translated into virtually every language and distributed to nearly every culture around the world. It is consulted daily by millions of people for inspiration, guidance, comfort, and instruction. Many who revere the Bible believe its writings to have been inspired by an omniscient, omnipotent deity, the God of Judaism and Christianity. The words of the Bible are the words of this God. It is without error because the God which inspired the words of the Bible cannot err. But is an inerrant Bible really what we find when we read its pages? Is the claim of biblical inerrancy a text completely without error regarding all matters upon which it speaks, scientifically, historically, and theologically, clear and accurate? Or, when we read the Bible, do we find a text at odds with expectations created by the assertion regarding its divine authorship? God is described by many believers, taking their clues as to God's character directly from the scriptures, as among other things infinite and perfect, unchanging, almighty, all-wise, absolute, working all things according to his own immutable and most righteous will for his own glory, and abundant in truth. This God has sovereign dominion over his creations, including human beings, to do by them, for them, or upon them, whatsoever the God pleases. The deity's knowledge is infinite and infallible, and thus many believers maintain that the Bible itself, a product of this deity, is likewise without error. The Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy, formulated in October 1978 by more than 200 evangelical leaders, declares on behalf of a large number of believers, Holy Scripture, being God's own word, written by men, prepared and superintended by His Spirit, is of infallible divine authority in all matters upon which it touches. It is to be believed as God's instruction in all that it affirms, obeyed as God's command in all that it requires, embraced as God's pledge in all that it promises. Furthermore, being holy and verbally God-given, Scripture is without error or fault in all its teaching, no less in what it states about God's act and creation, about the events of world history, and about its own literary origins under God. This Protestant affirmation of the Bible's inerrant nature is reflected in Catholicism. The Catholic Church also states, The Holy Mother Church, relying on the belief of the Apostles, holds that the books of the Old and New Testaments in their entirety, with all their parts, are sacred and canonical, because written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they have God as their author, and have been handed on as such to the Church herself. Furthermore, in composing the sacred books, God chose men, and while employed by Him, they made use of their powers and abilities, so that with Him, acting in them and through them, they, as true authors, consigned to writing everything and only those things which He wanted. Therefore, since everything asserted by the inspired authors or sacred writers must be held to be asserted by the Holy Spirit, it follows that the books of Scripture must be acknowledged as teaching solidly, faithfully, and without error that truth which God wanted put into sacred writings. 
The conclusion about the inerrancy of the Bible across Christendom seems self-evident if the nature of the God which is believed to have inspired the writings of the scriptures is accepted. If God is all-powerful, all-knowing, incapable of error, committed to the truth in all matters, then surely his book, the only words this deity put into writing, is equally without error. The divine inspiration of the Bible is foundational to the belief that it is without error in all matters that it touches. It is the nature of God as an omniscient, omnipotent, and infallible character himself which drives the faith of those who profess biblical inerrancy. Inspiration means that the diverse authors who composed the various texts of the Bible were each given direct divine knowledge about God, creation, human history, the future, and any other topic on which they wrote. The authors were given a knowledge that they could not have had outside divine inspiration. The deity's inspiration affected the will, the intelligence, and all the executive faculties of the writer. And while inspiration did not render the authors as merely instruments, which moved pen and turned pages for God, their own personality and experiences were allowed to come through in what they wrote, Nonetheless, they wrote exactly what came from the mind of God, recorded without error. The Bible is also thought of as a manifestation of God, a God who is perfect and without blemish. In the Old Testament, God is revealed personally to various individuals. Adam, Abraham, and Moses are all said to have spoken with God. When Moses returned from Mount Sinai with the stone tablets bearing the Ten Commandments, his very skin and hair shone because he had been talking to God. God is also believed to have come in the flesh, in the person of Jesus, and as such was a perfect, sinless human being. The Bible, a manifestation of God in the written word, is itself perfect and without error, as were his other manifestations. Belief in the divine inspiration of the Bible and biblical inerrancy has a long history. Augustine, one of the early church theologians, declared, Of the canonical books of Scripture alone do I most firmly believe that their authors were completely free from error. And if in these writings I am perplexed by anything which appears to me opposed to the truth, I do not hesitate to suppose that either the manuscript is faulty, or the translator has not caught the meaning of what was said, or I myself have failed to understand it. Echoing this belief in the Middle Ages, Anselm wrote, For I am sure that if I say anything which is undoubtedly contradictory to Holy Scripture, it is wrong. And if I become aware of such a contradiction, I do not wish to hold that opinion. And similarly, Thomas Aquinas affirmed, It is plain that nothing false can ever underlie the literal sense of Holy Scripture. For Aquinas, the Word of God, the Bible, never errs, but is instead infallible truth. And this belief in the inerrancy of the Bible held through the Reformation as well. Martin Luther asserted that not only had the scriptures never erred, they cannot err. The reasons Luther gave were many, but mainly he believed the Bible was the very mouth of God, and God cannot lie. So if God inspired authors to write the words of the Bible, the authors themselves could not have erred, thus the Bible is inerrant. John Calvin, too, maintained inerrancy of the biblical texts. For Calvin, the Bible was the eternal and inviolable truth of God.
The character of God is explained by those who believe in him, and the claim of inerrancy of the biblical text which this God caused to be produced create a sort of hypothesis which can be checked for validity. If such a God exists, and he is responsible for the inspiration of a text without error, what might we expect, or not expect, to find in the pages of this document? Should there be an expectation not to encounter conflict between what the Bible records as God's activity in the creation of the universe, the solar system, planet Earth, and life upon it, and what modern science has discovered? Should there be an expectation to find a historically accurate account of how the nation of Israel came to occupy the land upon which their nation was built? Do the discoveries of archaeology support these stories? What if the Bible has stories most readers would consider better suited for children, including things like magically talking animals, people made of sand or salt, and magicians doing all sorts of fantastic tricks? Would such stories conform to or be at odds with expectations for the Bible's content based upon what has been said about the nature of the Bible's authorship and divine inspiration? Consider a leisurely walk across a field. In crossing the field, suppose a person comes across a stone and then wonders how the stone came to be in the field. They might answer that the stone arrived there after millions of years under the Earth's surface, having been subjected to enormous geological events. Certainly the person would not conclude that this stone was somehow unique in the sense of its origins. It wasn't constructed in a factory and shipped to its current location in the field. The stone is like many others the hiker has discovered on walks in many different fields. It is not exactly the same as other rocks, but it is unmistakably a rock. But suppose this person finds instead a watch in the field. Would this person, given what is told of watchmakers and watches, conclude that it too was the product of natural forces? A watch is distinct from stones because it has within it the clues of an intelligent designer. It sits apart from the multitude of stones scattered upon the ground and meets the expectations of someone familiar with watchmakers who comprehended the watch's construction and designed its use. It isn't a stone which bears its own marks of origin. It is a watch, which origins are with a watchmaker. But before opening the cover of the Bible, some who promote belief in the divine inspiration of its books say expectations cannot be brought to a reading of the biblical texts the way a person uses knowledge of watches to conclude that a watch was manufactured by a watchmaker. How can anyone predict what God can or will do, they ask? Why would God fulfill human expectations? It's not that anyone is asking this God to perform a certain way in order to fulfill certain expectations. That's backwards. The expectations brought to a reading of the Bible were created by the definition of what and who God is, and that the Bible, inspired by this deity, is without error. Just as there is an expectation for watchmakers to make watches and not stones, descriptions of God's nature as an all-knowing, all-powerful being and his involvement with the creation of an inerrant biblical text create an expectation that the Bible really be without error and not riddled with problems. It is impossible to approach the Bible neutrally if it is provisionally granted that there is a God and that this God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and capable of producing error and is ultimately responsible for what was recorded in the pages of the Bible. Expecting to find inerrancy, some readers are disappointed by what they find when reading the Bible. Far from an inerrant document, some readers are faced from the very first pages with errors of scientific fact, historical incongruities, and archaic, difficult to understand passages. It doesn't seem at all like the work of an omniscient, omnipotent deity. What is it that some readers find in these supposedly sacred scriptures which have turned them not into Bible believers, but Bible skeptics?
While the claim is that the Bible was authored by an omnipotent, omniscient God, and as a result is without error, historically, scientifically, and in every other conceivable way, actually opening the cover of the Bible and reading it reveals a great number of problems which give rise to doubts about its supposed divine authorship. For example, Internal Contradictions how many officers did Solomon employ for the construction of his famous temple? Was it 3,300, as stated in 1 Kings 5.16? Or 3,600, as recorded in 2 Chronicles 2.2? Who purchased the field with the money given to Judas for his betrayal of Jesus? Did Judas himself buy the field as reported in Acts 1.18? Or did the chief priests pick up the money that Judas threw at their feet and use it to buy the field as given in Matthew 27? Six and seven. Absurdities. Occasionally, the Bible reads more like a children's story than it does a sober record of human history and God's interaction with humankind. Many readers have problems taking the Bible seriously when they read within the first few pages of the book a story about a talking snake. Taste. Taste. A little Taste. further, and readers Taste. encounter a Taste. talking donkey. What? And then, what? a talking shoes bush. Shoes off. Shoes, shoes off. Shoes off. Historical Errors the biblical story of the Hebrew escape from Egyptian bondage is fraught with numerous historical errors and absurdities, not the least of which is the number of people leaving under Moses' leadership. The Bible reports that 600,000 men of military age, upwards of 20 years of age, left Egypt in the Exodus. If women of the same age, children, and the elderly are figured in, the population of Hebrews leaving northern Egypt numbered nearly two and one-half million virtually the entire population of Egypt at the time, according to historical research. And this population supposedly grew from a scant 70 persons in a mere 400 years. The biblical tale of the fall of Jericho also offers historical errors. Depending on the dates given by interpreters of the text for the exodus from Egypt and the subsequent conquest of Canaan, archaeological research has discovered the city of Jericho either did not have a wall for the Hebrew army to topple, or it was not populated at all. Scientific Errors From the first chapter of the Bible, readers encounter a story of creation that is wrong in nearly every assertion it makes about the formation of the universe, our galaxy, solar system, earth, and life upon it. The story mentions the creation of a solid canopy that acts as our sky, a barrier separating waters below the dome, the rivers, lakes, and seas, from a vast collection of water above it. The entire creative process is said not to have covered billions of years, but instead a mere six days. The Bible tells the story of a worldwide flood. In the tale, all life except those aboard a large ark is snuffed out in a global deluge. And yet, no evidence exists in the geological record to support such a fantastic story. Failed Prophecies and Questionable Ethics Readers of the biblical text also encounter failed prophecies. For example, Ezekiel 29 states that Egypt, in the not-too-distant future of the writing of the text, sometime in the 6th century BCE and heavily edited thereafter, 
would become so desolate that no foot would walk across its cursed soil. And yet Egypt is one of the longest continuously inhabited nations in the world. Problems also arise when readers encounter questionable ethics in some of the biblical tales. When a bunch of rowdy boys outside the city of Bethel in 2 Kings fail to show proper respect toward a prophet of the god Yahweh, teasing the man for having a bald head, the prophet calls down a curse upon the children. And God obliges, sending two she-bears out of the nearby woods to tear the boys limb from limb. Surely an all-loving God wouldn't participate in such an abhorrent action, would he? Any and most of these problems with the biblical text exist in all human literature, from ancient Greek myths to a randomly selected Stephen King novel. And when encountered in these other forms, most readers think nothing of them. So why is the Bible held to a higher standard? Might that be considered unfair? The Bible is held to a higher standard not because readers are unnecessarily critical or prejudiced, but precisely because the expectations for the biblical text created by the assertions regarding its divine origins and claims of inerrancy made by its adherents have themselves created this higher standard. Watchmakers are expected to make watches. Expert watchmakers are expected to make expert watches. The Bible, so its advocates state, is not just another ancient book of myths and religio-political propagandistic exaggerations or a dime store novel. It is the inerrant, unchanging, sacred Word of God. But if the Bible was divinely inspired, its inspiration was clumsy and unconcerned with the reader's understanding or comprehension of the text. Faced with the reality of contradictions, absurdities, historical and scientific errors, failed prophecies, and questionable ethics found in the biblical text, how do advocates of perfect divine inspiration maintain belief in the Bible as a holy book? They do so by employing apologetics, and the ones who engage in apologetics are known as apologists. Given the sheer number of problems with the biblical text, the apologists certainly have their work cut out for them, but they've had centuries to refine their craft and design arguments to answer the skeptics. How good are those arguments? Apologetics, specifically biblical apologetics, are concerned with the defense of the Bible as the inerrant and supernaturally inspired Word of God. The word apologetics comes from the Greek apologia, meaning defensible, and takes its lead from the Bible itself. 1 Peter 3.15 states, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. Meekness and fear aren't always found in apologetics, as defense of the Bible is a contentious and highly personal affair. Challenges to the Bible's authority as God's word is a challenge to a person's worldview and sense of values. Biblical apologetics respond to objections raised by those skeptical of the claim of divine authorship and inerrancy in a way which attempts, at least ideally, to establish the objective truth of biblical inerrancy and the exclusivity of the Bible as a divinely inspired collection of literature. All apologists work under an agenda, which includes belief in the scriptures as God-given and with a particular religious view in mind. The Bible supplies, for them, instruction and direction which guides their lives, and they see skepticism as an attack on their worldview. If their worldview is rendered false by such criticism, apologists may fear a loss of hope, direction, or purpose for their lives. For some, it may also mean a loss of income. Because they have invested belief in the Bible and its claims, they are driven by the command in 1 Peter to defend these views, and defend them they do, at whatever cost.
If the claims of the apologists are true, and the Bible was authored by a divine being with absolute knowledge and power, why are apologetics even necessary? The fact that apologetics exist itself undermines the very claims of divine authorship of the Bible and inerrancy. If the Bible needs defense, it is precisely because it is not clear in what it states, which requires clarification, is an error over matters of history and science which need repair, and raises questions of authenticity, morality, and accuracy which beg for answers. Can and would a perfect God, with the character of infinite and perfect knowledge, all wise and abundant in truth, be able to author or inspire a work which is not clear in what it states, is an error over matters of history and science, and raises questions of authenticity, morality, and accuracy? If such issues are found in the Bible and require human intervention to explain them away, the Bible seems much less a work of divine influence. Apologists seem to admit that the Bible does have numerous faults and cannot be trusted to be read alone. God may have chosen the very words of Scripture, but he did so poorly and requires the intervention of the apologist. The apologist then must edit, augment, alter, and put correct what they believe God really meant to say. The problem of apologetics is exacerbated by the fact that rarely does there exist a single apologetic for any given problem found in the Bible. One apologist admits, in some cases there are two or more separate comments on similar Bible passages. This is due to the multiple apologists commenting on the same passage, and the fact that apologists do not always agree on the best solution to certain difficulties. For this apologist, they assert it is actually a good thing to have a variety of solutions to biblical problems, so that those seeking clarification of difficult biblical passages will then be able to think through for themselves which solutions best satisfy their questions. But if two opposing apologetics exist for a single problem found in the Bible, how is anyone to decide which apologetic solution is the correct one? Is it really simply a matter of personal choice? Is interpreting the Bible a democratic affair, where the majority rules? And why would a perfect God inspire a Bible which produces such a quagmire of apologetics? Was the flood of Noah a local affair or global in scope? The answer varies by apologist. Do the mismatched numbers of Solomon's officers in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles reflect one author including reserve officers or different standards in officer rankings? That will again vary by apologist. The fact that various contradictory apologetics exist for problems uncovered in the biblical text is evidence that apologists cannot agree on how to interpret the Bible. The only thing they can agree on is that a plain reading of the narrative is itself absurd and in need of explanation. Each apologist operates under a personal, religiously driven agenda to remove obvious and embarrassing problems from the Bible. Apologists are nothing if not inventive in their efforts to interpret the Bible for their own specific purposes. Faced with the reality of competing apologetics, the apologist may argue that they are but mere mortals. Apologists are bound to make mistakes. If there are conflicting interpretations of biblical passages, the fault is not in the Bible, but in the all-too-human, all-too-fallible apologist. But if the fault were not in the scriptures themselves, why then did the text produce conditions which gave rise to apologetics in the first place? The very fact that the Bible is not clear, is not infallible, is the reason apologists exist at all. And yet they produce as muddled, as fallible explanations for the Bible as the Bible does with a straight reading. Some apologists, however, 
see themselves as, in a modern sense, fulfilling the role of an Old Testament prophet, speaking and interpreting, correctly of course, the Word of God. They acknowledge competing apologetics but reject them, if they do not agree with their own, as misguided at best, demonic attempts to confuse the faithful at worst. In other words, while the Bible may appear to be fallible, these apologists are not. Such arrogance, however, needn't negate the fact that competing apologetics nonetheless exist and each is supported by its inventor as the true interpretation of the text. Again, the fact that the text needs to be explained by any mortal should give one doubts as to its divine nature. So who are we to believe? A Catholic apologist? An Evangelical Protestant apologist? a liberal Christian apologist, a Mormon apologist? Or should we let the Bible speak for itself? For the believer in the divine inspiration and infallibility of the biblical text, this is no small matter. But even for the skeptic, the choice is important. Does one hand over the interpretation of the Bible to an apologist who clearly has an agenda and a vested interest in how those texts are understood? One should exercise great caution when encountering apologists. What drives them to interpret the text the way they do? What tools do they bring to an understanding of the text and how are those tools being used? Do apologists allow the sciences to help them interpret the text? Do they consult with the social sciences, with cultural anthropological studies, with geology, astronomy, biology, linguistics, archaeology. Do they represent these fields fairly, or does the apologist merely employ such fields of studies to support a specific agenda, manipulating the data so that a desired outcome is achieved? Even when the Bible is clearly an error, do the apologists acknowledge this error or craftily spin another magical tale to make the Bible say what they want it to, creating the illusion of inerrancy at the Bible's own expense. Many apologists have tried to explain the existence of errors found in the Bible by claiming there were no errors in the original manuscripts, even though some errors may have crept in over time. What they mean is that the originally penned versions of each of the Bible's books were completely without error, but that, over the centuries, men who copied these books introduced minor mistakes into the text. But what gives apologists reason to assume this original version of the Bible was itself inerrant, other than their belief that it was? No original Bible exists to check for inerrancy, and apologists can't explain why the original version of the Bible was without error, but that subsequent copies contain them. It simply makes no logical sense. If human error was not allowed to mar the perfect originals of God's script, why was it allowed to deface the copies? An original inerrant Bible is exactly what one would expect were the Bible inspired by an omniscient, omnipotent God. And just such an inerrant original is what is claimed to have existed by biblical apologists. However, if a God were interested in inspiring an inerrant original Bible, it follows that this God would be as equally interested in assuring inerrant copies of the text. But this is not what is found. Errant copies are, however, what would be expected for texts not under divine stewardship. Without an original Bible to verify the claim of inerrancy, the only Bibles currently available for examination are the errant copies. Errant copies then evidence not divine authorship or inspiration, but an all-too-fallible human production. Deferring to an inaccessible original version of the Bible does not help support the claim of biblical inerrancy.
While going through the biblical text, readers cannot help but notice strange descriptions of natural phenomena which are at variance with modern scientific understandings of our world. Referring to the sky as a solid dome, for example, or to the sun as moving over the earth as a runner runs a race, is unexpected if these texts were authored by an omniscient being who must have known the sky was a permeable atmosphere and that the sun was stationary in relation to the earth. Such language of appearance is known as phenomenological language and is, in and of itself, not an error, strictly speaking. From a human perspective, the sky does appear as a dome covering overhead, and the sun does appear to move across the sky, as opposed to the observer moving beneath the sun. Apologists assert that God allowed such phenomenological language to be used in the biblical text because, well, there never really is a reason given for why God allowed such language to be used in the Bible, other than the self-affirming reason that God allowed it. Some apologists will point out that even today people who know better, like weather forecasters on TV, use phenomenological language like sunrise and sunset. Are we to assume scientific inaccuracy when the TV forecaster uses such words and phrases? For the next three days we're going to see a warming trend, 65, 69, Yes, because the sun does not rise and the sun does not set. These are terms of convenience and are in our language, largely because they exist in such ancient, scientifically ignorant literature like the Bible. If people knew 3,000 years ago that the sun does not really rise and set, but that the earth turns underneath it, they might have invented different words to describe the phenomena. This seems especially true for those inspired by an omniscient God. It certainly is not absurd to expect that the Hebrew authors of the Bible would have invented new words to describe what God inspired them to write if phenomenological language would cause future confusion or doubt over the divine inspiration of the text. Was the Bible only inspired so the Hebrews alone could easily understand it? The Hebrews are described as the only tribe of humans whom God favored with his presence and his knowledge. To evidence this special designation, it certainly would have been helpful if this God had inspired unique and scientifically accurate descriptions of natural phenomena, instead of merely allowing the Hebrews to blend in with their less favored neighbors, merely describing things the way everyone else was doing at the time. But the Bible, the apologists say, is not a science textbook. It needn't have been so precise that it ignores the plain speaking and observations of the human beings writing it. The authors were allowed to write things from their perspective, not from the perspective of God. However, the same is true of every other non-divinely inspired ancient and even many modern documents. If the biblical text was allowed to reflect the inaccurate perspective of human beings, and not that of God's overarching perspective, how can the apologist, or anyone, tell the difference between a biblical author writing something phenomenologically because he simply didn't know any better, and a biblical author writing something phenomenologically because God allowed him to do so during divine inspiration? The text, written either way, would look identical, so the appeal to phenomenological language is something God simply allowed to happen, but was nonetheless responsible for during the process of divine inspiration, is an empty, unsupported, and self-serving assertion. How can we know when God allowed, under divine inspiration, an author to use phenomenological language, the apologist may be asked. When the author used phenomenological language will come the reply. The assertion gets us nowhere. The use of phenomenological language certainly doesn't support the claim of divine inspiration or biblical inerrancy. How does one distinguish between a divine inspiration of phenomenological language 
when its use is perfectly natural for uninspired works of literature. Some apologists will argue that what looks on the surface to be errors of scientific fact found in the Bible are instead instances of the use of equivocal language, matters which were simply too complicated for the biblical authors to comprehend, but not for the creator of the universe to understand, were inspired to be written in equivocal language so that the ancient writers could get as close to the truth without actually having to face it head on. Terms were inspired to be left undefined and vague for the ancient audience until future minds encountered the text with sufficiently advanced knowledge to understand what God was really trying to say. So for example, the description of the sky in Genesis 1 gives the impression of a solid domed canopy which rests above the earth, separating the seas, rivers, and lakes below the canopy from a vast extraterrestrial reserve of water above. However, according to the apologist who invokes the inspiration of equivocal language, the Hebrew term rakia, used in the biblical text to name the sky dome, and which has its etymological roots in objects which are solid, like tin or gold, and hammered or stretched out to cover another object, is actually equivocal enough to allow for a later audience, educated in the discoveries of modern science, to understand the term to really be referring to a permeable, multi-layered atmosphere. or even to outer space itself. What such an apologetic assumes, of course, is that the ancient authors and their audience were too unintelligent or naive to understand the reality of God's revelation, and so he condescended to them, like children, tucking a deeper meaning into the text that these more simple-minded people apparently couldn't possibly comprehend. However, it is not at all true that the ancients had less intellectual capacity than do modern humans. It's simply a fact of history that they didn't have access to the knowledge that we have today. It is not the case that ancient people were too mentally challenged to grasp and comprehend more complicated ideas. Certainly they had as much intelligence to understand and articulate accurately basic scientific facts as can most high school students today. The apologist insults these ancient authors by treating them as a sort of subspecies of human without the intelligence to understand the basic science of the 21st century. But this simply is not true. While the ancients may have never seen a modern automobile, they certainly had the mental capacity to be taught the basics about the vehicle and more how to drive one. Additionally, if God had inspired the texts in language merely appropriate for a more naive people, with the proper anticipation such an omniscient being would possess for a more intellectually sophisticated audience in the future, why do we not find clear markers in the Bible to such an effect? In other words, why do we not find such phrases as, this is written not as it is, but only so that you will understand, or some other such marker in the text? These phrases would certainly give evidence to support the apologist's assertion that certain words or ideas were inspired to be equivocal in the text for ancient audiences in anticipation of future readers with the intellectual capacity to understand God's greater meaning. Lacking such phrases, the apologist's assertion looks rather vacant. Apologists are right about one thing, however. Equivocal language does exist in the biblical text but it exists not because it was inspired to be there. Vague and undefined terms are used because the authors themselves did not have a clear and precise understanding of the nature of reality. They were driven not by a lack of intellectual capacity, but merely by scientific ignorance. When the sky, for example, was given a descriptive name which evoked an image of a solid dome stretched to cover the earth like an overturned teacup, it was because the ancient authors clearly thought this was the nature of reality. The use of equivocal language was not done for a later generation's benefit, for modern apologists to stuff their own meaning into the text. 
literature produced purely under the limitations of human knowledge certainly would use equivocal language when writers did not understand the deeper nature of a scientific reality, when knowledge was guided by superstition, myths, and legends. However, equivocal language is not something one would expect to find in a text inspired by an omniscient deity. As one apologetic source puts it, false religious systems often use equivocation to twist scripture to make it say what they want it to say. But not only the so-called false religious systems, but even biblical apologists use this technique. A number of apologists try to remove problems found in the Bible by redefining words. Many words in the Bible have multiple meanings. For example, the Hebrew na'er can mean a boy, a youth, a young man, or even more broadly, children. Most of the time, words with multiple meanings can be understood in the context in which they are found, and often by helping words. So for example, boy is clearly the definition of Nair in the story of Elisha and the bears in 2 Kings. Here, Nair is defined by being paired with another word, Katan. Katan can mean young, small, or insignificant. When qualifying Nair, however, Katan always means small, as in young. And so the Katan Nair in the story of Elisha are little boys, or young children. However, the apologist who is embarrassed by the story of Elisha's curse in 2 Kings, in which God sends two bears to maul the Katan Nair, the little boys or young children, because of the insult they leveled against God's prophet, is motivated to change the meaning of Katan and Nair, so that the story is no longer as horrific for modern ears. The apologist removes the words from their context in 2 Kings and imposes upon them alternate but improbable definitions in order to rewrite the tale. So for example, Nair is said to indicate an older male instead of a boy or child, and Katan is defined as insignificant. In the hands of the apologist, the term Katan Nair no longer means little boy or young children, as the context of 2 Kings clearly implies, but insignificant male. The little boys in the story of 2 Kings are then transformed into a marauding band of homeless, dangerous highwaymen in the throes of the apologetic frenzy, so that the curse from Elisha and the ensuing bear attack become a reasonable and palatable outcome for such a vicious gang of outlaws. There certainly is nothing wrong with assigning the proper definitions to difficult words or phrases in the biblical text. The problem with this approach comes when the goal is not to educate the reader, but to obscure a Bible difficulty, cover up an embarrassing passage, and promote a specific apologetic agenda. Difficult Passages in the Bible even those which appear to be in historical or scientific error, are claimed by some apologists to have been woven into the text through inspiration of God in order to persuade readers to become more attentive and engaged with the text. Difficult passages in the Bible, especially those which reflect an alien time and culture, cause readers to spend more time studying the scriptures to grasp their meaning, which has a therapeutic effect, some apologists will assert. The Greek word for disciple used in the New Testament literally means pupil or learner, and those who freely choose to immerse themselves in a deep study of the Bible mark themselves as true disciples of God. God certainly isn't interested in coercing people to come to belief in Him by inspiring a clear and accurate text. But how is having the best available evidence for the existence of God and His inspiration of the biblical text, a text clear and unambiguous, considered coercion. In the sense some biblical apologists may be using the word, coercion can be defined as compelling to an act or choice. Using this definition, perhaps a clear and unambiguous biblical text could be considered a form of mild coercion into belief in God. But how can that be considered a bad thing by biblical apologists and Christian theists? Isn't this exactly the goal they have in mind? 
Isn't the practice of apologetics itself a form of coercion if it clears confusion about the text and offers evidence for God's inspiration of the narratives and his existence? How is making the text clear through apologetics not coercion, but a clear text from divine inspiration is? It isn't that there's a request for God to write his text across the sky, on the moon, in rock formations on Mars, or to zap perfect personal understanding of the Bible into everyone's heads. A science textbook, for example, may be difficult to comprehend because of the subject matter, but the authors of such texts strive to write them as clearly and as free from error as humanly possible. Certainly they are not trying to coerce anyone into learning from their textbooks, but merely making the subject matter as accessible and understandable to as many readers as possible. Translators, too, will work extremely hard to translate texts from one language into another so that the meaning of the original text is retained in the copies. Humans work on their own literature to these degrees when the text is important enough to warrant such painstaking precision and often achieve remarkable results. Students read their texts and understand the subject matter without encountering unnecessarily cumbersome chapters or obvious errors of fact. And this is accomplished solely through human effort. So the question is, why isn't the divinely inspired book of an omniscient, omnipotent God similarly as accessible as supernaturally possible? Even though it might be expected that a book authored by an omniscient being should be easier to understand and not require advanced degrees in multiple languages, the social sciences, archaeology, and the like, the fact is the Bible does require its readers to dig down deeper than what is plainly on the surface of the text. And this is to be expected, not from a book authored by an all-powerful God, but one authored by very real, very earth-bound people who didn't have the advantage of omniscience, who were not careful to understand their words would carry across centuries to people of other places and other times, but instead were prisoners of their own time and place, their own culture, unable to break free of these constraints precisely because they were not liberated by a powerful deity inspiring a timeless document intended for all humankind. The Bible shows all the features of literature produced out of a specific age and culture, and thus must be approached as such, without the expectations of divine inspiration forced upon it by its apologists. But beyond the failure of the text to meet the simple expectation of clarity, if it were indeed inspired by an omniscient, omnipotent being, Objective study of the Bible often has the opposite effect of what the apologists intend. Many who read the Bible and study it in depth come to the conclusion that the scriptures certainly are not inerrant, and in fact are far from what one would expect from a document inspired by a timeless deity. To be sure, such a study helps place the Bible in its historical context. Understanding the political, social, and religious structures out of which the Bible was produced helps explain some of the peculiarities of the text. However, apologists who claim a more rigorous study of the Bible leads one to a better understanding of the Bible as God's inerrant word start with that conclusion already in mind and then tailor their study to conform to this belief. If a student is not willing to go where the studies lead and is only interested in gathering carefully selected data to support a preconceived conclusion, namely that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, then why bother being a student of the text at all? Such a person might as well simply announce, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, and not waste time with the pretense of being a student of the biblical text. Some apologists note that to have a truly inerrant copy of the Bible in today's world would create enormous logistical problems for God. Each of these problems has to do with the transmission of God's inerrant word as given in the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek of the originals into the variety of human language alive in the world today.
According to virtually every apologist for the inerrancy of the biblical text, the original scrolls and parchments of the biblical books were inspired inerrant. However, they say errors can be misunderstood to exist in the text due to translation, because every language has its own unique idioms, archaic terminology, puns, euphemisms, and other forms of speech, these often do not translate well into other languages, and thus, certain sections of the Bible can seem confusing. Problems can arise from translating these unique forms of speech into modern languages, and these problems can cause some readers to perceive errors in the text when the error is actually in the translation. Thus, the perceived error does not exist in the original version of the Bible, the apologist will argue, but only in the translations. However, apologists seem to forget that unique idioms, archaic terminology, puns, euphemisms, and other forms of speech are present in all human literature. They are markers which place such literature firmly in the time and culture out of which they were produced. Apologists cannot explain how the presence of such unique but confusing speech argues for a divinely inspired document meant to transcend such limiting use of language. Clearer language is certainly something one would expect from an omniscient, omnipotent being. Apologists cannot seem to explain why, if a god is responsible for inspiring his divine intentions clearly into Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, he is not also capable of inspiring equal clarity into translations of English, Spanish, and Chinese, other than to assert it somehow causes logistical problems for the deity. Are translators somehow closed to divine inspiration, whereas the original authors were not? Nearly all apologists acknowledge that current copies of the Bible contain errors, even if that acknowledgement is only for the minor copyist errors that exist in the texts. For example, in 2 Chronicles 9.25, the author states Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen, which seems to contradict 1 Kings 4.26, which states Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen, which is correct. Apologists will claim that the original manuscripts only had one number, probably the 4,000 figure, and the apparent contradiction introduced by 1 Kings 4.26 is merely a copyist slip of the pen. Is it possible the two verses did, at an earlier time, agree? It's of course possible, and more so, it's probable. And even if they did agree on the figure for the number of Solomon stalls, wouldn't a copyist's error explain the contradiction? It certainly would. Certainly this is the actual reason why we find these sorts of errors in the Bible and in most other works of ancient literature. Before the creation of the printing press, copies of ancient documents were done by hand by very fallible human beings. Monks sitting in damp quarters lit only by natural light or candles put quill to parchment while looking back and forth between original scroll and the copy they were producing. Clearly minor errors like the number of horse stalls Solomon kept could easily creep in from even the best and most attentive copyists. They were only human after all, and given the number of centuries that separate the original versions of these books and the most recent copies, it's virtually guaranteed that such errors would enter the text. But this isn't just any ancient manuscript. This is not even one of Homer's epics, or an account of the deeds of Alexander the Great. This is a book originally authored by a powerful, careful, painstaking God who took the trouble to inspire his words perfectly when first written, according to the apologists. However, this God then, by the very fact that such errors exist, must have suddenly went inattentive and allowed these originally perfectly inspired words to diverge into contradiction in the copies. But why? Apologists complain that if God were to inspire every copy of his Bible to be as inerrant as the original, he would be turned into a micromanager. 
This complaint doesn't travel far because, among other things, it assumes micromanaging the inerrant copying of the world's most important and only divinely inspired book is somehow a waste of God's time. That in order to have as perfect copies as the original, God would need to work miracles. The apologist's complaint ignores the fact that God, according to the assertion, thought it important enough to intervene in human history and the lives of certain human beings to have his book produced, but then assumes the maintenance of its reproduction was somehow less important. If it was not defiling the will of the original human authors to have them write the exact words God intended, why is it violating a copyist's will to have him pay strict attention to the reproduction of this most sacred text. Indeed, a simple error which found its way into an early printing of the Bible was quickly discovered by non-omniscient humans and corrected by them. The so-called Immoral Bible was published in the 16th century with Exodus 20.14 reading, Thou shalt commit adultery. If humans catch and correct such errors of transmission, why not God? While some apologists acknowledge these copyist errors in the biblical text, they nonetheless claim that they are minor and unimportant to the overall message of the scriptures. They point out that while copyists may have confused the number of stalls Solomon may have had, they did not confuse the much greater message being communicated through such stories. Indeed, the apologists will boast that only by a supernatural act could God have preserved this message of scripture through the centuries and this consistent message is proof that God divinely inspired the biblical texts. Such apologists who so readily claim God's miraculous intervention in preserving the message of the Bible are the same apologists who claim it would have been an act of coercion or micromanagement for God to have miraculously intervened to keep the very words of Scripture inerrant. Apologists are often found wanting to not only have their cake, but eat it too. Apologists may state that having inerrant translations of the Bible into every known language of the world would be logistically impossible for mankind to handle. And yet, the Bible today is the most widely translated book in human history. Without a doubt, allowances by the translators are made for the wide variety of languages and cultures in which these Bibles are produced, but nearly everyone has opportunity to read the Bible in their own native tongue. So far, the logistics involved in producing the Bible into all these languages has not been a problem for humankind. So assuring an inerrancy in these translations surely shouldn't be a problem for an omnipotent God. Error or inerrancy can exist in any language. The stories of the Bible are the same no matter what a person's worldview or assumptions. Either the walls of Jericho fell to Joshua's trumpets, or they did not. The story is either historically inerrant, or it is not. The story's inerrancy does not rely upon a person's language. However and again, some apologists view inerrant Bibles appearing in every language, in every corner of the world, as an act of coercion. They envision God manipulating the hands of every scribe copying every version of the Bible, interfering with printing presses to assure an inerrant delivery. But the reproduction of the text to reflect exactly the words God wanted would no more be an act of coercion than was the original inspiration of the text. If God was careful enough to assure the inerrant delivery of his original texts, there is no logical or logistical reason why he could not do the same with the copies. Some apologists want to redefine what an error is by stating that what may be considered an error in the mind of a 21st century reader of the biblical text may not have been an error in the mind of the original author. We should judge the inerrancy of the Bible by the standards of those who wrote it. For example, in the 11th chapter of Leviticus, 
verses 13 and 19, we read of a very odd classification of animals. Odd, of course, to 21st century ears. And these are they which ye shall have in abomination among the fowls, and the stork, the heron after her kind, and the lapwing, and the bat. The modern reader will immediately recognize the apparent error. Bats are not birds. However, in this verse, bats are included, not in a modern biological classification system, but in an ancient one. For the biblical authors, bats and birds were classified together as winged animals. The Hebrew word translated fowl in the King James Version of this verse is oaf. In more modern translations, the word is rendered bird. The ancient Hebrews did not classify animals the way modern biologists do. There was no classification for mammals, and so the bat merely belonged to the group of animals with wings. While the modern classification system may be a more scientifically accurate way to group animals, grouping together animals because they have winged appendages isn't necessarily an error. However, an ancient classification system which lumps bats together with birds clearly is reflective of human invention, not divine. These sorts of markers are the fingerprints of human authors, exactly what one would expect if the text was not of divine origin. While such writing might not necessarily be an error, it certainly reflects its very human authorship. Some apologists lay blame for biblical errors at the feet of the Bible's critics. They acknowledge that the Bible isn't perfect, but it isn't perfect insofar as it obviously wasn't written with a modern audience in mind. Skeptics raising objections to the claim of biblical inerrancy are sometimes labeled fundamentalist atheists, who simply don't know how to read the Bible properly. Apologists will insist that God inspired the authors of the biblical books but that doesn't mean God inspired the writings so that they would be understood by everyone. These so-called errors in the Bible highlighted by skeptics are created by a misunderstanding of the Bible, of not reading it properly. The question is then raised, who can understand the Bible? The apologist will answer, of course, that they understand the Bible best and offer their services in guiding readers through the difficult passages of the Bible. Never mind that apologists often disagree amongst themselves on the best paths through these treacherous pages. Despite the apologists' self-serving function of accusing critics of the Bible of not understanding it in its proper contexts, the Bible is indeed a product of its own age, and as such is difficult to understand. It must be approached in its own contexts, literary, historical, cultural, and so on. Of course, this is as true for the Bible as it is for any other work of ancient literature, so it's difficult to understand how an acknowledgement of these contexts does not undermine the assertion of divine authorship. The Bible isn't easy to understand precisely because it wasn't the product of a supernatural being. The Bible is difficult to understand for the same reasons most ancient literature is difficult to understand. It is the product not of a god, but of human beings a product of human beings not inspired to write the thoughts of a divine entity, but inspired by their own imaginations, inspired by the peculiarities of their own times and cultures, written within the confines and structures of their own worlds, separated from modern readers by thousands of years. The ancient Near Eastern authors of the biblical text did not possess the concept of a world created from nothingness. They did not possess concepts of quantum physics or string theory. They invented stories from their immediate surroundings, circumstances, and experiences. Theirs was a world of finite resources, struggle, nature, and chaos. In the creation story of Genesis 1, the author did not, could not, Imagine his God magically conjuring a planet, much less an entire universe, from nothing. 
Instead, formless water pre-exists everything. It was from this watery chaos that God moved and brought order, and from this water the earth arose. In turn from the earth God formed the world familiar to the Genesis author. In this story God is more a manager, less an artist. Linear, logical, abstract ideas which permeate our Western world did not exist for the ancient authors writing the biblical narratives. Additionally, from the overall structure of Genesis 1, it is clear that this story is giving an explanation for the Jewish institution of the Sabbath. The author, already aware that his religion dictated rest on the seventh day of the week, crafted a creation story to explain, in part, where this practice originated. Many such origin stories, known as etiologies, existed in a variety of ancient literature. Study of the cultural and historical contexts from which these stories arose helps bring these facts into focus. But this is precisely true of any ancient literature. The Bible certainly is not unique, and that is the point. For many, a deeper understanding of not just the biblical texts, but discoveries of history and modern science actually lead them away from belief in the Bible as the inerrant Word of God. How is understanding the opening chapter of Genesis as depicting God as an administrator of chaos in the context of ancient Near Eastern mythology, or as an etiological story regarding the institution of the Jewish Sabbath day, rather than a historical account of creation, supportive of biblical inerrancy? Understanding the character of God, or the institution of a religious practice in this historical context, does not make the creation story of Genesis any more accurate. But if Genesis was never intended to give an accurate description of creation, and was merely meant to describe what the authors believed about their God, and why no one in their culture was supposed to work on the seventh day of the week, how is that any more evidence of inspiration or infallibility than a contextual understanding of the Egyptian creation myth or the Babylonian? An apologist may object that if copies of the Bible were maintained as inerrant as the original, such copies would become the focus of worship. This would then take focus away from worshiping the true Creator and turn human beings into idolaters, worshiping a book instead of God. However, such an apologist does not explain how inerrant originals did not create this idolatry, so it is unclear how inerrant copies would. An apologist making such a claim may draw a parallel between inerrant copies of the Bible and some other highly revered historical document. The original United States Declaration of Independence is just such a document. It is painstakingly preserved, held on display at the National Archives Rotunda in Washington, D.C., in encasements made of titanium and aluminum, filled with inert argon gas. Long lines wait to view the declaration with patrons passing through metal detectors and under the watchful eyes of armed security guards and electronic cameras. The declaration is indeed held apart from many other works of literature available in the United States, and doubtless an original Bible, should it ever have existed, would be similarly treated. More to the apologist's point, however, even exact copies of the declaration, made around the time of the original, are held in high regard. These rare copies are found in various collections, meticulously preserved, highly prized, and carefully guarded. Occasionally, these exact, some may say inerrant, copies of the original declaration go on public tour. These tours are an example of modern security practices. The apologist will claim that this reverence for even a copy of the declaration is what is feared would follow exact inerrant copies of the Bible. The attention is drawn to the document instead of the author, and misguided reverence is exactly what God wants to avoid, and so he allows errors to mar his otherwise perfect text. However, what the apologist fails to realize in this extravagant, imaginative scenario which he invents erupting around in errant copies of the Bible is that such caution is taken with the Declaration of Independence and its few surviving contemporary copies not because they are inerrant, but because they are rare. 
The reason the Declaration of Independence on display at the National Archives is preserved and protected by such extraordinary measures is because it is the original Declaration of Independence. Doubtless an original Bible would be held somewhere similar, perhaps in the Vatican, under similar cautionary measures. And why not? The original Bible would be rare indeed. The reason the few copies of the Declaration are similarly held in high regard is because only a relatively few exist. If only a few inerrant copies of the Bible existed, they too would likely be highly prized. However, anyone with access to a computer can read the Declaration, word for word, copied exactly from the original without copyist error or translation difficulties from the National Archives website. Users can download an exact, inerrant copy of the Declaration of Independence from a multitude of sites, or purchase a precise duplicate from many retail stores. All of these exact, inerrant copies of the Declaration of Independence have not caused a frenzy of attention over their existence. There are not throngs of security-checked patrons lining up to get their error-free copy of the Declaration at local bookstores. Purchasers online do not have their personal information cross-referenced by the Department of Homeland Security when downloading an inerrant copy. While the original Declaration of Independence can be said to be revered, almost to the point of worship, by many Americans, the same cannot be said of these exact copies printed from PDF files on cheap computer paper. And the same would be true of inerrant copies of the Bible. The focus would not be on the fact that there were copies of an inerrant Bible, but on the fact of the inerrancy itself. In other words, having a copy of an inerrant Bible would not cause anyone any surprise. It would be the inerrancy itself, sustained through centuries of copying, which would be astonishing. But isn't that what the apologists already claim about the Bible? That it is already inerrant, once the supposed errors are explained away through apologetics. The only thing which could have maintained inerrancy in the Bible from the originals down through all the copies would have been divine intervention. But apologists already claim divine intervention in the originals, so why would divine intervention in the copies be any greater a problem? Inerrancy in the copies would simply support the apologists' claim of divine inspiration and biblical inerrancy. The only thing truly inerrant copies of the Bible would do is perhaps put apologists out of work. The fact that numerous errors exist in the Bible, even simple ones, caused by copyists, is evidence that even if inerrancy existed in the original Bible, it was not maintained in the subsequent copies. And this is to be expected of a Bible not under the stewardship of an omnipotent being, but as evidence instead of the very human production and reproduction of the biblical texts. Most apologists insist that the Bible was inspired by God. But some acknowledge that it was written by fallible human beings and assert these human authors are the ones responsible for introducing error into the text, simply because they were human. In other words, when men wrote the Bible, they included historical and scientific error because they simply did not have the knowledge we have today. God is not responsible for this sort of error. For instance, the author of Isaiah was like many other ancient people of his age, sharing belief in the world as a flat, disc-shaped object. This author had no idea the earth was a sphere, and so when he wrote in Isaiah 40:22, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them like a tent to live in. It was under this erroneous impression that the earth was flat. Nonetheless, the author of Isaiah was writing under the inspiration of God, writing of God's magnificence and awesome power. God was not inspiring the author to write scientifically accurate prose, but merely was the inspiration for the writing itself. In a similar manner, a man may write a poem, inspired by the love he feels for a woman. While the woman and his love for her inspired his writing, the writing itself belongs solely to the man. If this is true of the Bible, the very words of Scripture can no longer be considered divinely inspired, 
and the doctrine of inerrancy is irretrievably lost. Clearly, passages like Isaiah 40.22, which describe the earth as a circle, a flat, disc-shaped object, are in error scientifically. Few supporters of the Bible's divine inspiration would say that God inspired the author of Isaiah to write a scientifically inaccurate description of the earth. However, such supporters may agree that Isaiah's love and respect for God inspired him to write this passage in the context of the scientific naivety of his day, merely in order to express this love and respect. What is important is the love and respect, not the descriptions of the earth as a circle or the sky as a tent. The question is raised then of how this makes the Bible any different from any other inspired literature, like a poem written from a man's love for a woman. Such inspiration may indeed explain some of the errors in the Bible, but it does nothing to evidence the Bible's inerrancy or the existence of God. God needn't exist in order to explain someone's inspiration caused by belief in God. The Bible then is no different than any other religiously inspired literature. And if error is merely a product of the author's time, Jesus is recorded as having made certain errors himself. In Matthew 19, Jesus refers both to Adam and Eve, as well as to Moses, as if these were historical persons. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement, and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. The science of biological evolution negates the statement Jesus made that God created human beings, male and female, at the beginning, just as science negates the statement in Isaiah that the earth is a circle. Also, since there is no historical reference to the Exodus outside of the Bible, and centuries of archaeological research has failed to turn up evidence of the Hebrews' massive escape from bondage in Egypt, Moses was, in all likelihood, merely a legendary figure. If such errors in the Bible are the result of human fallibility, then were these errors by Jesus due to his own scientific and historical ignorance? But as Jesus is believed to have been God incarnate, few evangelical apologists take this approach. More conservative apologists use a variation of this theme. While they acknowledge that men wrote the Bible, they still maintain that it was through direct inspiration of God. However, God had to work through these men, who were typically fallible and bound by their own time and cultures. So passages like Isaiah, which give an inaccurate description of the earth, were indeed inspired by God directly to reveal his magnificence and sovereignty over creation. But the inaccuracy itself was a byproduct of having this writing done through human beings. In other words, God could not or would not override human fallibility, and so errors of scientific and historical fact were, unfortunately and unavoidably, woven into the text. How such limitations could have bound an omnipotent being's hand is rarely discussed. When it is, apologists prefer to weakly assert that God simply did not wish to coerce the writers into writing exactly what he wanted, but settled for a close approximation. How this argues for divine inspiration or inerrancy, however, is lost. The Bible, with such human fallibilities woven into the text, looks exactly like literature written exclusively by human beings. Some apologists will try to rescue the inerrancy of the Bible by referring to a symbolic or metaphoric interpretation of certain troublesome passages. For example, the Genesis 1 story of creation is obviously at odds with the discoveries of modern science. 
Some apologists will abandon a literal reading of the chapter in favor of one that, admittedly, is probably more faithful to the original context of the tale. These apologists will note that the author of Genesis 1 was not writing a scientific textbook on the origins of the universe, but was instead authoring a polemic against neighboring ancient Near Eastern polytheistic mythologies, which competed with the strict monotheism of the Yahwist cult. These apologists will stress that the creation story of Genesis was written poetically, and as first century Christian apologist and theologian Augustine asserted, no Christian will dare say that the narrative must not be taken in a figurative sense. The error with this sort of apologetic is that it settles on one type of literature that these passages may demonstrate, while ignoring other types of literature into which these biblical stories may fall. For the apologist defending the creation story of Genesis 1, it is obvious how stressing the poetic nature of the writing can help deflect criticism of the tale if it is read literally. In light of modern scientific discoveries, the creation story of Genesis 1 is absurd. However, to simply conclude the entire chapter is poetry, noting that Genesis 1 contains certain poetic structures, is jumping too hastily to a desired but erroneous conclusion. While some passages of the Bible are clearly metaphors meant to be read figuratively, they nonetheless give clues about the Hebrew worldview, which is frequently not a worldview consistent with modern views, and certainly not a worldview one would expect from an omniscient God. Genesis 1, while containing metaphor and symbolism, still contains elements of ancient Hebrew cosmology, which is scientifically inaccurate. Genesis 1 is an ancient cosmology, attempting to explain the origin of the sky, the earth, plants, animals, and heavenly bodies. In this sense, it is an origins myth. An apologist may try to divert attention away from the chapter's scientific errors by claiming the story was not intended to be read as proto-science, but nonetheless Hebrew proto-scientific ideas are embedded in the text. This simply cannot be glossed over by claiming Genesis is poetry. The imagery used in the poem of Genesis 1 is still the imagery of a scientifically ignorant ancient culture, and not what one would expect to have been inspired by an omniscient God. Certainly, if the text was divinely inspired, this deity could have coded its message in a more accurate cosmology, satisfying both ancient and modern audiences, providing evidence of the supernatural origin of the narrative. As it stands, the text has all the appearance of having originated in the scientifically ignorant mind of an all-too-fallible human author without benefit of divine aid. Genesis 1 is also a narrative, with characters, tension, plot, and conclusion. It serves as religious propaganda, carefully designed to stand in opposition to other ancient Near Eastern creation stories and legitimize Hebrew religious, political, and social values. The author of Genesis 1 has taken an older, rival mythology from Mesopotamia and has recast it in a Yahwist mold. Fragments of this older Mesopotamian myth can be found in other books of the Bible, including Psalms, Job, and Isaiah. And if Genesis 1 was originally meant merely as metaphor, and not to be taken at all literally by anyone who read the narrative, was this important insight missed by the author of Exodus? Exodus 20.11 For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath, and hallowed it. It would seem this author wasn't aware of modern apologetics, which steer away from a literal reading of Genesis 1. Many apologists using this technique, however, fail to apply this symbolic or metaphoric reading to passages which hit much closer to home, especially for the Christian. The empty tomb, for example, may not have been a historical reality, but a figurative answer to critics of the early Christian movement regarding the reality of Jesus' resurrection it's a rare apologist who explores the possibility of the New Testament gospel stories of the empty tomb as potential metaphor. And when they do respond, they are as foaming at the mouth fundamentalist about the literalism of the empty tomb as any creationist is about the historicity of Genesis 1. In the end, 
referring to the Bible's symbolic or metaphoric meanings does nothing to elevate it to that of a divinely inspired text any more than any other ancient or modern metaphoric literature can be considered divine based on a figurative reading. It certainly does nothing to argue for infallibility either, at least not objectively, as the apologist can assign almost whatever meaning they wish to a figurative text and claim this is what was originally intended. The creation story of Genesis 1, for example, an ancient Hebrew monotheistic cosmology, can be interpreted symbolically to support any number of ideas, including a reference to the Christian trinity. With God, the Father, as the center of the story, the Creator, Jesus, the Son, as the Word through which everything was brought into existence, and the Holy Spirit, that which hovered over the primordial waters. For the apologist, deciding which biblical passages are figurative and which are literal is a highly subjective and individualistic exercise. Some apologists will claim that reading and understanding the Bible cannot be done alone. Reading the Bible properly requires reading it with the assistance of the Holy Spirit. As part of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is that manifestation of God which some Christians claim helps to illuminate their minds as they read the Bible. The Holy Spirit leads readers to the Bible's truth. In the same way that the Holy Spirit inspired the writing of the Bible by working through the minds of the authors who wrote it, the Holy Spirit works through a reader's careful study of the scriptures. As God spoke directly to the hearts of those writing the Bible, through the Holy Spirit he speaks to the hearts of those reading it. This all sounds good to those who already believe, but what does it really mean? How can one test whether or not they are reading the Bible with the Holy Spirit? How does reading the Bible with the Holy Spirit independently support biblical inerrancy? The Bible, so the claim goes, was already divinely inspired during its production. Apparently, this wasn't sufficient enough to get the message through, and so the book must be read with the author's help. If the Spirit had done such a poor job inspiring the original manuscripts to be free from scientific and historical error and clear enough that most people could read the Bible plainly, what confidence is there that the Spirit can do any better of a job inspiring understanding of the cumbersome, defective text for individual readers today? It's a proposal that's virtually irrelevant to anyone who hasn't already decided the Bible is inerrant, not to mention the circularity of stating that the truth of the Bible is hidden from those who don't believe in the truth of the Bible, but not from those who believe in that truth. And there's the fact that different people claiming to have read the Bible under direction of the Holy Spirit come to different conclusions about the parts that cause doubt about inerrancy in the first place. Does one know they've properly read the Bible with the Holy Spirit if they understand the days of the creation story in Genesis 1 refer to literal 24-hour periods, or if they understand the days of the creation story to be eras of indeterminate length? Does one know they've properly read the Bible with the Holy Spirit if they understand Noah's flood was merely a local affair, or if they understand Noah's flood was global? Referring to the Holy Spirit as a guide which dissolves problems found in the biblical text is a useless suggestion for supporting the claim of inerrancy. Errors exist in the Bible. This fact is undeniable, even for the apologist. But a number of apologists will argue, while the Bible does contain error, these errors do not obstruct God's inspired truth from coming through the pages of Scripture. In other words, the Bible as we have it today may not be a perfect recreation of the original inerrant scripts, but it is sufficiently accurate enough for readers to understand God's meaning. But what meaning is that? When Jesus was asked in the New Testament Gospel of Matthew what he considered the greatest commandment, he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. 
You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets referred to in the passage from Matthew are the Jewish scriptures as they existed in the first century CE. So if we are to trust what Jesus said was the inspired core message of the Bible, it was merely to love God and each other. Do we really need 66 books to tell us that? It seems a terrible waste of time, energy, paper, ink, and space. If the Bible is to be sifted through merely for this sufficient message, what use is the remaining material? It's very difficult to imagine why, in addition to the brief inspired truth of Matthew 22, God needed to include a story about a man sacrificing his daughter to Yahweh after a rash vow. How does that story contribute to God's inspired truth? Or does it? Why include the story of Elisha's calling down a curse upon a group of little boys? Or the number of stalls in Solomon's stables? Or God coming to kill Moses for not cutting off his son's foreskin? What do these superfluous anecdotes do to further God's inspired truth? And if they don't, why are they in the Bible? They seem more like stumbling blocks rather than stepping stones to this ultimate message. But perhaps the inspired truth of the Bible is a bit more than what Jesus said. Perhaps the inspired truth is more like what is recorded in Romans 5.18. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. This is the Christian message of salvation, anchored in the belief that sin entered the world with Adam's disobedience in the book of Genesis. While minor errors or problems in the text may not be too large of a distraction for the message of this inspired truth to come through the text, historical and scientific errors of the Bible are a considerable drain on its sufficiency. If the authors of the Bible could not accurately describe the nature of the sky or the shape of the earth, how are readers to trust what these authors had to say about how one man's trespass led to the condemnation of all? If the authors of the Bible were wrong in their description of the fall of Jericho, or about a prophecy concerning Egypt, how are readers to trust what they say about one man's act of righteousness leading to justification and life for all? If there is no truth to the story of a worldwide flood, what confidence is built about their being inspired truth elsewhere? And if modern biological science is right, and humanity as a species arose from common ancestry, what room is there for the Genesis story of human creation, the trespass of one man leading to the condemnation of all, and the necessity for another man's righteousness to lead to justification and life for all? Or perhaps, we just uncovered the motivation for apologetics. The Bible is difficult to understand. It is at times unclear, contradictory, and prone to both scientific and historical error. A tremendous amount of dedicated and focused study of ancient customs, cultures, and beliefs is absolutely required if one is to understand the Bible on its own terms, and that is exactly what is to be expected if the Bible is the work of numerous authors and editors working with various religious and political agendas over centuries of time, a product of a collection of books, all in turn products of their own times and places. The Bible we encounter free of the manipulative tethers of the apologist is the exact opposite of the Bible these same apologists claim it to be. Some may object, why can't the Bible be both the inspired Word of God and a product of its own time and place? The answer, of course, is embedded in the assertion that the words of the Bible were of such critical importance that they needed to be crafted and woven into the text by an omniscient deity. Remember what the believers have asserted regarding the inspiration of the Bible, that the authors working under God's direction were consigned to writing everything and only those things which he wanted. God is not confined to a culture or a time, according to those who believe in him. He is timeless, existing everywhere. 
Thus, the expectation is set that such a god would inspire his collection of books with words accessible to everyone, regardless of place and time. Apologists may scoff at this idea, but they do so only because they realize the Bible simply does not fulfill this expectation. Apologists provide excuses, not explanations, for why their God did not successfully create a book, a manual for all humankind, free from error, and which everyone, everywhere, could easily understand. The apologists will say inspiring such a Bible would have amounted to nothing more than coercion on the part of God, not allowing humankind to freely choose whether or not to accept the Bible as God's word. But they fail to explain why they do not consider the originals to have been a form of coercion for those who first heard or read them. The people who wrote the first editions of the biblical books surely did not need instruction in the language in which the Bible was written. They didn't need lessons in cultural anthropology to understand the contexts of their own societies. They didn't need anyone to explain strange idioms or sly euphemisms found in the text. But did they need someone to point out that the ancient cosmology used in certain sections of the Bible wasn't meant to be taken literally, but was merely metaphor? If an inerrant and clear biblical text amounts to coercion, why did God allow coercion of this first audience, but none thereafter? And what of apologetics itself? If the goal of the apologist is to correct and explain the inspired text so that the errors disappear and the difficult text becomes clear, and an error-free understandable text is a form of coercion, are they not themselves engaging in coercion? Or the apologist may argue that the Bible could not possibly have been written for all humanity to understand. Doing so would be logistically impossible. It would amount to everyone having their own private version of the Bible. But again, why is this so? The complaint seems to be that God is limited in his power to inspire a book that could be read and understood by virtually everyone. This is the same God, so the Bible claims, who created the universe. Who breathed life into the first man. Who flooded the entire world. Who rescued millions from captivity in Egypt with great miracles. And who came to earth in the form of a man, died on a cross, and then came back to life three days later to save humankind from ultimate destruction. Yes, that God. It is that God whom the apologists suddenly claim would not be able to inspire the kind of text which would be truly free from all error and accessible to all people. It was mentioned that some advocates for God's existence and the divine authorship of the Bible think that expectations cannot be brought to a reading of the Bible. Bringing expectations puts human constraints on God and that simply cannot be done with an omnipotent, omniscient being. However, these same apologists also say that God cannot or will not produce an error-free and clear copy of his inspired text and claim to know why. The apologists shackle their God with all sorts of limitations, saying he cannot be expected to do this thing or another to assure true inerrancy and clarity of the biblical text. God was forced to work within restraints. Apologists find the Bible the way everyone else finds it, full of scientific and historical errors, contradictions, and discrepancies. But because the apologist comes to the Bible with a preloaded belief in a God which inspired the text, they then craft a God around these scientific and historical errors, contradictions, and discrepancies. The God invented by the apologist is then used to explain why such problems with a text exist. The claim is God is all-knowing, so why does the Bible say the earth is a circle, when it is actually a sphere? Because, the apologist will say, God inspires the use of equivocal terms in the text to accommodate the scientific ignorance of the original author. The God crafted by the apologist could not have inspired the use of a more accurate term, or inspired the author's scientific curiosity to explore the true shape of the earth, so as to write accurately about it. 
Instead, the apologist claims God merely molded his inspired word to the ignorance of the authors he was using to write his divine text. The apologists read God's mind and explain how and why he allowed the authors of his book to write the way they did, even though at times these inspired authors introduced errors and unnecessary ambiguity into the text. But the apologists simply cannot have it both ways. Either the Bible can and should be approached with certain expectations created by definitions of the God which inspire the text and of the text itself, or it cannot, and the Bible must be allowed to speak on its own very human-authored terms, including its errors, contradictions, and discrepancies. Is the Bible inerrant? No. Was it ever inerrant? No one knows, nor will anyone likely ever know. But one thing is for certain, the best way to approach and read the Bible is by first silencing the incessant, distractive voices of the apologists. Apologists approach the Bible in a very specific way. They come to the Bible with beliefs about it they want validated, and they will validate those beliefs by any means necessary. How do apologists obscure understanding the Bible? First, it cannot be understood properly if it is burdened with the belief of infallibility. Twisting the plain words of the Bible to make it conform with the discoveries of modern science or by obscuring the simplest thoughts of the biblical authors by hiding within the text figurative meanings only the apologist seems to understand is another way apologists do violence and dishonor to the text of the Bible. Postulating something for which there is no evidence or need is certain to be a waste of time. There is absolutely no evidence that the Bible was divinely inspired, or is, or was, inerrant. There is no need to postulate supernatural reasons for why errors exist in the text, whether a god allowed the use of phenomenological language, inspired equivocal terms, let copyists slips of the pen to enter the text, when naturalistic explanations, which are successful in explaining similar features in other works of literature, work quite well. Driven by belief in the inerrancy of the Bible, apologists forget that the authors and audience of the early narratives were just people, the same as anyone today, struggling to make sense of the world and their part in it. The proper way to understand the Bible is to leave it in the space and time in which it was composed. It cannot be dragged from its original contexts into a 21st century context. Certainly the Bible can speak to us in our own day, whispering to us questions which ran through our ancestors' minds, questions which still continue to puzzle us today. But the answers the biblical authors composed for these questions are not what are important. Indeed, many of those answers were undeniably wrong. The universe did not take six days to form. There was not a single man and woman in a garden somewhere in the ancient Near East who gave birth to all humanity. There was no garden. There was no original sin. There was no global flood or mass exodus from Egypt or conquest of Jericho, and the list goes on. What is important is to connect with the questions the biblical authors asked. Where did we come from? How did we get here? Why is there suffering? How can we eliminate it? What does our future hold? These questions are what link today's readers with the Bible. The answers the Bible gives are sometimes simply wrong, but they give us insight into the thoughts of those who came before us. We do not properly respect the biblical authors if we assign them a secondary role in the creation of the text. The Bible exists as a bridge to another place and time, and we need to realize just how extraordinarily fortunate we are to have it.